Uh, thank you everyone for being here today. Uh, welcome to the Hudson Valley Writers Center for an afternoon of poetry and conversation with Patricia Spears Jones, Peter Covino, and EJ Antonio. My name is Sophia Bannister. I'm the programming assistant here at the Writers Center. If today is your first time joining us for a reading, welcome. We hope you continue to come to our readings, classes, and events. Please check our website for the complete list of offerings, including our classes on Zoom. We hope all of you will return to the Writers' Center in person as we welcome Tom, Tom Slay and Daniel Lawless on Sunday, April 28th at 4 p.m. And again, as we welcome Rowan Ricardo Phillips and Mary Jo Bang on Sunday, May 5th at 4 p.m. Before we begin, I want to thank the board, our teachers, and our students who are the beating heart of the center. We also want to recognize all the foundations and organizations who support us, including the Bydale Foundation, the David G. Taft Foundation, NISCA, and Arts Westchester. I also want to thank my colleagues, Jennifer Franklin, Misty Yarnell, and Christina Pap Papadopoulos for all their hard work, as well as Leslie, who's here with us today to help us with the reading. Um, reading first today is E.J. Antonio. E.J. Antonio received fellowships in poetry from the New York Foundation for the Arts, the Hurston Wright Foundation, the Cave Conum Foundation, and the Cave Conum Foundation. E.J. is the author of two chapbooks, Every Child Knows, Premier Poets Chapbook Series 2007, and Solstice, Red Glass Books 2013, as well as a solo jazz poetry CD, Rituals in the Marrow, Recipe for a Jam Session. EJ is a founding board member of the nonprofit arts organization One Breath Rising and a founding member of the improvisation group, the Jazz and Poetry Choir Collective, which released its debut CD, We Are Here, in April 2020. Please help me welcome EJ Antonio. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out today. It's such a nice day. I know a lot of people are probably trying to go to the water, to the beach, <laughs> the parks, just to get out of the house. We've had so much rain. Um, I'm going to start today with a poem that I wrote that I think is a fun, a fun poem. It's called Ode to Housework. I've done my 10,000 steps. Today, going up and down stairs, answering the bell, the ringing and buzzing of washer and dryer, too many trips to count. I've done my weight training all day, jerk lifting wet king size comforters, folding them and sheets and clothes, filling and emptying laundry baskets, bench pressing 30 pounds of squirming toddler, my granddaughter, good for the abs and biceps. I've done my aerobics, taking out trash bags, carrying dishes from table to sink, catching objects randomly thrown by a 19 month old whose favorite phrase is, uh-oh, and no. And if I didn't know better, something that resembles a frustrated, oh shit, <laughs> remarkably used in its correct context. We admit there is nothing like Saturday chores to get the blood pumping, the back hurting, the muscles aching, the knees throbbing. There is nothing like housework, that laid back personal trainer waiting to make the body miserable. <laughs> Another passing. I am rooted in the sounds of my past, years pushed into silence, a cascading rain of rhythms, swallowing me fast like a tasty meal. On East and West Harlem streets, me, a flightless bird, thin, gawky-limbed, fledgling, trying to find balance between the music perched on every corner, gospel the blues, rhythms, and more blues, sharing space with bachata, salsa, mambo, rumba. 
How have I managed to walk the high wire between infant and elder? When these sounds twist me, shift me back and forth, throw me into girl-child memories every year. I am anchored in an unscalable tide, roaring mute echoes of my dreams deferred so often through decades, they faded into the frayed edges of old photographs, blurred, almost forgotten, as midnight and New Orleans neon fleur de lis descends, unfurling into me another 365 days of new arias waiting to bloom. I breathe in, breathe out. My ever swelling past. Latchkey. Sold my drama in the street gutters and sewers of Harlem. Harvested all that was bad, good about being a latchkey child. In the 60s, it was just life's way to learn you to work your own fields of possible impossibilities, to make bread from concrete, ride a bicycle on a fire escape fry bacon and eggs on a marble notebook, where you wrote homework and list of chores to get done, clean those aphids off the house plants, wash dishes, mop the kitchen floor, stand the mop up to dry on the fire escape. The sun will take care of it and the clothes on the line. For safety, lock the doors. Always look through peepholes. When someone knocks, don't answer. Brush your teeth, get ready for bed, double check the locks, glance in the mirror. See what lonely looks like on your face when you are grown. Look back, marvel at all you've learned since then. Admire how lonely has become a deep crease in your forehead. Matriarch. Someone sang for me. From behind her teeth, the sound of blood's rush. Rush. Called me from myself into myself, a body, an earth song of love and bitterness. Someone sang for me. Amazing grace. Deep in Virginia woods, someone sang for me. How sweet the sound. Deep in Virginia pines, a hem razored the sky vermilion, pushed the wind to shove me down a snake-filled road. Fighting for my life, someone sang for me. Pulled all my am and am not from origin's darkest beginnings, and melody flowed through me. Amazing and great. And melody flowed through me, planted itself in me. How sweet, 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 sweet. I heard a soprano rustling leaves in my ear. Someone sang for me. Someone sang for me. Someone rattled the question in my voice, shook loose words from my hand. The pine cones buried in Virginia woods. I've always known someone sang for me, sang for me, sang for me. We're in that water. And the oak shivered agreement sacrificed their pulp for me to write down all the songs. Amazing grace, wait, wait, wait. Someone sang for me. Someone sang for me as I will sing for her. 
the someone of me coming, 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 coming after me. The house. It is the annoying whirring of the cicadas. This movement in the tall trees crushing the songbirds antebellum blues. A slow paced homage to her sandstone brick house emptied of voices and the shuffle of feet it echoes and looms weathered and diminished as the taxi maneuvers curves of unkempt road behind the overgrown fields. There's a vignette between the 150 year old oak. Snakes and ticks and hummingbirds and sparrows and horsefly and crickets all fight for space in the failing roof gutters. These are sprouts of pine stretching out roots, holding strong against the breeze. Like it or not, grandma was right. We heirs have failed it and the land. Every year we pay a tax to keep it silent to our neglect, keep our disinterest in living there a secret. I'm just thinking, the blues woman in me want to make a man be grateful to climb barbed wire naked within a naughty whining of naughty puppy wine. So pitiful, even the devil give him a second chance to wag that tape. <laughs> sure. I'm just thinking, the blues woman in me want to make a man be grateful to climb barbed wire naked, whining a naughty puppy wine so pitiful, even the devil give him a second chance to wag that tail. <laughs> She is too frail to move. Her hips, feet, remember her free in her sultry days, dancing, 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 mambo. Passing cigarettes and beer offered by the bodega one floor below the social club, she struts. Her heels must click, low cut tops, Thigh high split skirts must fit just so. Cause she's dancing, dancing, mumbo, mumbo, mumbo. She caught the same man in all his different skins with her heavily lined eyes, fake eyelashes glued on Saturday evenings in darkness, she sits by the window. Her shoulders practice the gentle back and forth roll of a woman who knows. Big gestures gain nothing but spectacle. Small ones sparkle to garner the prize. She imagines, traces the tickle of her hem's slight swish against her skin. Dancing, dancing, mambo, mambo, mambo. The soft shift of his hip yields her into his gentle but firm lead. Above the sirens and street noise, she hears in the shifting gears of her wheelchair. One, two, three, five, six, seven, one, two, three, five, six, seven. As she moves toward her widowed bed, the wheels turn, click, click, click. 
the romance, the rhythm of mambo, mambo, mambo. I have time for one more poem. And this is for all the ladies in the room. It's called What I Claim. I claim the kindness churning in me, the anger spilling over from me, the frightened child in me, disinterested me, funny, the sadness in me, joyful, humor, the wrongs in me, the mean-spirited, judgmental me, I claim. The brown girl shy in me, the Virginia, South Carolina, New York funk and well-mannered in me, the sachet, put on some blush, a little powder, mauve lipstick, cause I still got it going on in me. The back roll, side rolls, muffin top, statuesque, hair thinning, me. I claim the R&B, Latin, jazz, gospel, folk, country, western, classical, world music, listening, me. Urban, suburban, me. Book reading, smart as hell, not genius, me. Just smart as hell. The dress it up, dress it down style in me. The flat wearing, kitten heel strutting, can't wear them high heels no more, me. The still can wash my own dirty drawers when I damn well please me. Claiming my gotta get up and go see something somewhere. I'm claiming the four walls of me. The house cleaning when necessary me. The lazy bits of me. The easy takeout BBQ, loving somebody else's cooking me the grandma second in command matriarch in me, the mother tones in me, the daughter submission in me, the dramatic comedic queen in me, the singer in me. I claim the good morning heartache in me, the poetry in me, the untapped sexy proud Mary keep on returning, always paid my own bills, thank you very much me. The Arctic cool, African heat blazing in me, the spiritual aura pouring from me, forgiving and unforgiving me, the saint not sanctified in me. I claim all my alpha and omega dancing on threadbare days. I claim me for me. <laughs> Thank you. EJ, thank you so much for that reading. Um, up next, we have Peter Covino, a prize-winning author and well-published scholarly writer with an expertise on contemporary poetics, ethnic and working class culture, and queer studies. His poems have appeared in the Academy of American Poets Poem a Day, the American Poetry Review, the Paris Review, and the Yale Review, among many others. His full-length poetry collections include Cut Off the Ears of Winter and The Right Place to Jump, both from new issues, poetry, and prose. His newest translated book, What Sex is Death, Selected Poems of Dario Beleza, is forthcoming from University of Wisconsin Press. Please help me welcome Peter Covino. Mm. Cooperate. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, we can see yourself right in that. A little scary. Well, thank you, every everybody. Thank you for being here, Jennifer Franklin and Sophia and Leslie, um, and this impressive Hudson Valley Writer Center crew. Um, and thank you, dear BFF, um, Patricia Spears Jones. Um, and EJ Antonio, it was really great to hear you. I, I'm really honored to be here. Um, so I'm going to start with a poem um, from this poet I've been translating for um, maybe the going on about a decade. Um, and at first it started out, it was going to be a small project, and then it turned out to be a selected project. So um, eight books, a lot of, when I first started, a lot of these books um, weren't even in print anymore, and they were um, hard to find in places. 
Um, and his dates are 1944 to 1996. Stadio Belitsa was, among other things, the secretary for uh, Pier Paolo Pasolini. Um, he was a, a major um, a prize winning poet, won the Via Reggio Prize um, in 1976 for a book called Secret Death. Um, and and the, the title of my selected book, What Sex is Death, is from one of his poems. Um, he, en he ends up dying of AIDS-related complications in 1996. Um, and this is a poem from happier days, believe it or not, um, from 1982, from a book called Love Book. But it's about um, a thwarted love relationship and his sort of wild energy. Where you sleep, I watch over. I ripen the vendetta and fuel it till it's soothed by this last kiss. How strange the repetition, the end of love after love when the decrepit heart knows at last to beat in peace. How peacefully that dark animal sleep waits for him now that everything's shriveled and squinting eyes do nothing but seek out vice, only this age of raising Cain appeases the fury, appeases the chanting of the furies, rabid in their knowledge of being neglected. The riots certainly easy listening, unfazed by the cock that in its codpiece sings. Yeah, he's not afraid to go there. And this is from a manuscript I've been working on called Brave and Cruel Acts. Um, a lot of it um, is in the last few years. And this first poem is called Reading Ovid with my sister Aurora. <clears throat> from the moment coronavirus hit Italy, its empty luminous piazzas, the unseen unknowing neighbors, the mind flashes to a four-hour hired car ride at 6 a.m. Down, down via Eduardo Grilla, past San Michele Church, before its rubbled remains from the 1980 quake, walls plastered in black placard death notices, the candlelit cemetery at the Aria of the Madonna, the shimmering dawn glow of the Ipinia Valley, and route to the distant port crowned by the Virgin. Since the virus, she hasn't been able to speak her language, doesn't recognize the sounds she makes, like Io's horrified cries after she was raped by Jove and humankind changed. So the, these, um, a lot of these poems are like really short sort of sonnet-like um, poems. This is another one called No Ancestors in These Bones. Mountains of angled sunshine and wide open fields dappled with olive groves and earthy Alianica wines. Bent over the exercise ball, the spine settles into Irpina, tectonic plates of ruin macerated destiny, homophobe, pederast. At the gas station hotel, we ate homemade fusilli, Sunday ragu, an assortment of sorbets, plum, walnut, peach, preserved in the fruit skin. We arranged the funeral through the ether and delivered the father's dust to the void just the slab lifter and tomb removed, and the tomb remover gaped into a 10 foot tiered abyss, not a relative, a town crier, a single flower. Brave and cruel acts, names and details change to ensure confidentiality. Bushwick in the eighties, a community organizer gunned down by drug dealers when she tried to keep them off the block away from her family. The bravest act? 
I called out some addict admiring my leather jacket, bluffed. I'd leave the jacket, but he didn't know what my relatives might do, tough guy. Then Luz called out from the fourth story window to leave her social worker alone. The day before we were to discharge, that's what they called it, her three kids home from foster care, danger of open wounds and broken window guards, Luz tumbled from that same window. The cruelest act, somehow telling her older children, the youngest still a toddler. Millennial phone call, estranged older sister who sued our parents to no avail, named each sibling in the lawsuit, her voice quavering, grateful. I had heard of her son's grave illness, leukemia, my nephew, wanted to sooner, but with COVID rampaging, no room in the riddled psyche, hierarchy of pain, you are father's first and preferred lover. I wish I could have saved you then, spared you these years of wreck and reckoning, even as you ran off and rejoiced when our immigrant ship sailed those thousands of Atlantic miles, determined at all costs to keep your children away from this chain of familial abuse. I didn't mean to cut you off, Mom died yesterday in the nursing home. The cruelty, perhaps, of her enduring almost a whole century. We won't be able to bury her for months because of the backlog and lockdown and the thought of her cold and crowded in a body bag and hospital gown devastates me to the core. Severe and mean, to you too, I know, but thank you for letting me know and for asking about my son. We're hopeful it's resolvable. Then the unspeakable silence of your breathing, its rhythms on the other end, almost rehearsed, expectant, but not cruel. Down soundless corridors of rancor and disaffection, burned house of clemency, years that confirmed how our mother had served you up to him and the jealousy that must have stirred the envy of his attentions. So yeah, this one's a little lighter. <laughs> a little. Um, no, maybe significantly so, but um, <clears throat> so this one is called Conversations with the Living and the Dead, and it's in memory of Giorgio Bassani, who was one of my first teachers. He's the guy who wrote The Garden of the Fienzi Contini. Um, it won, you know, the Academy Award in 1971. He was wonderful and turned me on to a lot of the work I did in translation. And his dates are 1916 to 2000. And my parents, my mother was born in um, 20. Five. My dad was born in 23. So there was always this kind of like paternal thing going on. And this is in three sections. And it pretty much thinks about him as a teacher. And then when I became a professor, sort of what I channel channeled from him. And it, it's a spring poem um, where the Magnolia figure is really um, prominently. And, you know, there's a lot of Magnolia in bloom now. So I thought it might be fun to read. <clears throat> Conversations with the Living and the Dead for Giorgio Bassani. One, word storm. The phishing scheme we've never believed existed attacked the computer today. Hacked, heart bleed, Monday's spam, and taxes due Monday. Phantom limb of the old Japanese magnolias in front of Green Hall that I walked past Monday, Wednesday, and Friday this semester, yet for years barely noticed. Rot infestation 
and Hurricane Isaac mangled most of one's branches, less than a third left of what I remember. Each class lately, the trees, she's, been a mixed metaphor in introduction to literature. Language, a socio-political question, extended shadow figure one week, Cobus Magnoli distinctly not filling up the notebook's horizontal boxes, despite its minimalist representational points. Two, call it sleep. This week, Henry Roth's immigrant relatives from Western Galicia, modern day Ukraine, tragically enough, and we're trying to slog through this long form text. Albert Charles, bull skewered father, Kenya's alleged fall with the Goyim and the vituperation of the immigrant thicket. These twin trees, number 90, on our land grant campus's arboretum map. One, still in her prime, blushing, almost in full, full bloom. The other, at the roads and gnarled, rheumatic, not unlovely. These gifts proffered from the famous Italian Jewish poet, his magnolia in the courtyard outlasts the fascists and most of his kith and kin. Today, on this week of Passover and Easter, rise up from that post 9-11 apocalyptic tomb in Ferrara. Point your finger to the air at us, as you did when we interrupted your lectures, like Plato in Raphael's Three, The School of Athens, that fresco in the Vatican. Speak again about the poets in that clear-hearted, invert-loving way, even then. The radio alarm clocks come on just now, a clarinet solo for the end of time, the instrument's disembodied spine, floating vertebrae, poised in front of an empty stage's abyss of birds. This morning, these ground down stones of your heart's shore, the sand in the hourglass's unattainable gleam. And I'm going to end with, um, well, I'm going to end with a little more hopeful poem. Um, so this is uh, Dario Belissa from a book called I or Me from 1983, from his uh, most fruitful middle period. And um, it's from a, a section called The Traveler of Shadow. Um, and it's untitled, so the first line becomes the title, sort of de facto. I believe I should have a child who looks at me from the unmade bed and smiles when I listen to a distant heavenly music, dreamlike, the door opened onto the infinite and an infinite prayer, calm words whispered in the open wind of a dark night. I look at you, son, sleeping serenely in colorful exultation, camouflaged in red blankets on a white couch, a little blue cap on your head to cover your short haircut like a prep school boy or a soldier. Only me, I alone look at you, son, not bearing any gifts for you today on the occasion of your 16th birthday. I can only manage a few stifled virtues to soothe you in a future where no death, no matter how untouchable, escapes the hooked, horrid hand.
Thank you very much, Peter. Um, finally, it's my pleasure to introduce Patricia Spears Jones. Uh, Patricia Spears Jones was appointed to her current position as New York State Poet in 2023. And we are here today to celebrate her fifth poetry collection, The Beloved Community, published by Copper Canyon Press. This collection interrogates the necessity and fragility of human bonds, sensual, familial, and societal. Uh, Patricia Spears Jones, in addition to being a poet, is also a playwright, anthologist, educator, and cultural activist. She's the winner of the 2017 Jackson Poetry Prize from Poets and Writers and the author of Elucent Fire, New and Selected Poems. Her work is anthologized in African-American poetry, 250 years of struggle and song, of poetry and protest, from Emmett Till to Trayvon Martin, and Best American Experimental Writing 2016. She organizes the American Poets Congress and is a senior fellow emeritus of the Black Earth Institute. Please help me welcome Patricia Spears Jones. Why are all my friends so tall? <laughs> And I am so short. I used to be taller. Hi, this is amazing. I um, am very happy to be here. Uh, Jennifer had asked me to do this back in the fall. And I said, no, no, no. Let me do it in the spring. Because it's beautiful today. And which is why probably only about, you know, half the people who wanted to come are out there wandering around going, oh, flowers. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm so, and I really wanted to read with EJ and with Peter, and this book would not be in the shape it's in if not for Peter, a man who read three different iterations of this book before it got accepted by uh, Cop Copper Canyon. Thank you, Peter. He, he's owed every martini, uh, whatever he wants for 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 forever. Anyway, so I am really uh, glad to read from it and some new poems too. So um, because you wrote, read that marvelous poem about women and aging, always a fun thing. Uh, <laughs> I shall find one to read as well. Let me just find it. Okay. And I have allergies like everybody in this room probably. So I'm taking off my glasses. So if I start to weep, it's only because the allergies are doing that. It has nothing to do with anything else. Uh -huh. I love having a table of contents. It makes everything much easier. <laughs> uh -huh. Here we go. That's not really it's worth the wait, as they say, on, in many of those Thai BLs. It's worth the wait. Okay. So one of my favorite people in the whole world uh, is Papo Kolo, who is a uh, insane, excuse me, a very uh, actively interesting um, performance artist, has been for several decades. And I ran into him a few years ago, and we promised each other we would go out and have drinks. I haven't seen him since, of course, because this was pre-2020. But here goes. Um, he posts stuff on Facebook all the time that is very strange. So this is called Self-Portrait as Retratos de Cosas Locas y de Locos Stolen. So his, obviously, Retratos is Self-Portrait in Spanish. <sighs> Shall we have cocktails while slipping about the edge of catastrophe? Gin and tonic for summer, whiskey sour for fall. All is not well, yet sun illumines green leaf tree soon bare, soon bare. Our eyes prowl fence edges for morning glory vines. Our ears gallop from the booming base of pumped up cars. Our legs move as swiftly as catamaran and dock. We mock the heavens with calls for paradise now. Artists, 
Ramillay, the shadowed alleys of downtown Manhattan. Memories of dream dulled in punk and rock clubs, filthy bathrooms. How much of what was is still now in the body, in the bones of the body. Calcium loss, teeth loose, wrists smaller, so all bracelets dangle. Lips call repeatedly a song whose words are traces of tenderness, yet sung too softly as if only whispers could make the world hear. Followed by lipstick considered. I'm having fun today. Because it's spring. Why not? So Pam Nuchuk wrote something on a Facebook page about the color of lipstick. And a little, a, something was I went, that's interesting. I can use that. Okay. Lipstick considered. Ah, to have a blossom colored by lipstick. Nature saluted and mutated by chemistry. Elizabeth Taylor lipstick bloom, poet says. But which Elizabeth Taylor lipstick? The lush red hints in those brightly lit black and white movies, say Father of the Bride, or the soft blush fake innocent pink from Butterfield 8. Marthy in that mirror, not for sale. And these blooms in the Arizona desert, angling toward or away from the sun's rays, scars vast regions of America's south and west. We can only speculate how blossoms bless their beauty or curse it. How they bless this blush of red, this smear of pink, the lips once generous with flesh, now less so. But the pot of color is discovered. It almost imitates those desert blooms, their saturated, their natural rouge, and the poet's movie star shimmers in the night sky near her plane, Venus, seen so easily too far to touch. Ah, uh, but this can lead to some problems. Siren song. I have no metaphors today. All the analogies are taken. No one is wise enough or kind enough or smart enough to say what nobody wants to actually should say. Sex is messy. Humans hurt one another. Power shifts depending on who wants what more and everybody knows how to blame. There is no shame in owning the truth of one's ambition or the topsy-turvy ways in which we switch on or off what we think will get or, or what we think will get us what we want. He wants sex, maybe, or she wants sex, maybe, or both think that is what they should want, and then he does something stupid, or she acquiesces at an inopportune moment, or they find themselves at 3 a.m., waiting for 7 a.m. to come. That's the easy part, the dull date part. It's the uglier part that gets the headlines. The mad talk, the guy who just happens to have hands in places where they receive no invitation, the guy who thinks his girlfriend, his wife, his daughter, his sister, his mother is a punching bag. Oops, that metaphor. The guy who brings roses for bruises, the guy who calmly drives his car across the mother of his four children, that guy. He is a menace to society and we all know it. So how does he get away with doing this daily, hourly, by the minute? And why are all these roses stomped on? In the grave are too many women who once had roses for bruises. In offices, too many women who've had hands placed uninvited across, around, beneath their bodies. In homes, there are fathers who find incest the antidote for the dreariness of their wives. Or maybe it's the romance of it all. The romance of it all is done for. But the guys are stealthy and intelligent. It is not the black backlash, but the proffered alliance. 
the sweet tongue trying ever so hard to say just the right thing to make all the wariness, the necessary wariness, go away. In Greek mythology, sirens were female, but now the genders changed. Women watch for the rocks, be careful the talk, and examine the heart. The unhunted tongue may be a new undoing. Fire takes a long time to ignite. Mm -hmm. Poet. Uh, one of my favorite poets is Mongolian. She lives in Taiwan. Her name is Sui Murin, H-S-I-M-U-R-E-N. And uh, so I borrowed this wonderful epigram for her, uh, from her, um, her, her book, her little book called Across the Darkness of the River. Please do not believe my beauty. Do not trust my love. And the whole book is all about thwarted love. My goodness, she was thwarted for like ever. I don't know who the guy was, but he really was. He messed with her. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> the poet is Mungo. A translator follows her heart once broken, and yet she sings in a way that makes her broken heart my broken heart. She is an exile. The mountains are now ruled by China, and her culture is assaulted daily. Buildings blasted, children made to learn Mandarin. This is all too familiar, the ways of empire, very old ones, very new ones. But these are poems of love and poems of loss. The lover's inconstancy is all too familiar. Her limits are tender and angry. There are many storms in her poems. They rise from the mountains, from the sea, from the rivers inside her veins. They rise up. In oceans far from her, a woman reads her words and quickly says, Sister, I have been there. His hands holding mine, gone. His lips no longer touch mine. And yet, the yellow roses, the birthday kisses, our shared embrace of deep down Chicago blues, those conversations knee deep in the dream of dark loving, tremble my heart. And so you stand in the shadows at a train station, looking for the moment your love steps off his train. He is not alone, and you will not be happy. The storms throb the streets of Taipei, and scatter rose petals across the sidewalks and streets of Brooklyn. And uh, I'll read a couple more from this, but here's some more recent ones. I was in Kansas City when the Chiefs won. And uh, so I can say that, but more than anything else, I got to go return actually for the second time to the Nelson Atkins Museum. Uh, which is one of the great museums in this nation and probably in the world. And there are two amazing pieces in that museum. One I wrote about, oh God, 15 years ago. Uh, it's a painting by Caravaggio of St. John the Baptist in the Wilderness. And more recently, I just wrote about uh, Guayan of the Southern Seas, which is a 12 foot tall uh, sculpture that will calm your heart and soul. The first one is Mullen Like Ivy. In Caravaggio's paintings, the leaf's green is almost black, a rich deep green of high summer and old gardens, poorly maintained. You can hear the insects buzzing nearby and frogs. There should be frogs. But this is post-Renaissance Rome, cardinals, patrons, lots of lucre, an altarpiece for Octavio Costa, St. John the Baptist in the wilderness. He is the boy prophet tired. He has done his job, shouting in the desert, crying in the forest, freaking beasts, snakes, birds, and frogs. The Messiah is coming, and he has let the people know. Are they ready for this? Do they care? Civil authority does and watches for the same signs as John. Salome dances. And in a later painting, John loses his young head. Blame the woman. Blame the prophecy. 
but his beautiful mouth has told his story. Too late, O oh governor, temperance, and the Roman leagues. So I ask of this painting, is Malin like Ivy? And how did he get the power to ward off evil? Are all prophets doomed to have their heads displayed on canvases from Copenhagen to Naples? Or was John the favorite one? Prophet has done his job, shouting glory, telling truth, falling before twisting stars, ecstatic with the knowledge of a future, numb with joy. And the thing about Caravaggio, as all you probably all you know, is that all of most of his uh, subjects were like you know street boys. So the Saint John the Baptist is the prettiest of them all. I mean, he's just the Lord of Mercy. Anyway, so from the west to the east, the 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 one of the things about Midwestern museums is they have extraordinary. Um, Chinese, Japanese, and other Asian um, collections. They're just amazing, anyway. And uh, the Atkins Museum definitely does. The Guyan of the Southern Seas, uh, and Guyan was like, you know, the goddess of mercy. And... It is not the sculpture, it is not that the sculpture is over 12 feet high. It is that her face is becalmed. One arm rests on a base while the other extends past the knee. As if to say to all who look up, I am just here on the bridge between our world and others. Wood colored and decorated a kind of score so the humans and spirits and creatures of all kinds can find a measure of song. At the far end of a huge display of 11th century Chinese art, this marvel of sculptural skill and divine treasure brings us to a stillness that can be carried like a black pebble found on a black sand beach 40 years before ties that have crossed the Pacific from China to America break down the mineral marvels as a full moon shines and shines. We are in need of this grand icon, her placid face, a gift, a beatitude, a boon for nervous travelers and seekers of fine experiences, the pleasures of the unfamiliar. The Chinese artists are so skilled, it is as if they will this figure from a single piece of wood to withstand the ocean crossing, the scholars' debates, the hippies gallivanting. We are tourists in the southern seas, and we have no idea of who is navigating and what, but there she stands, and she offers this merciful gaze upon all of us, busy with our selfies and noise. We stop taking pictures. We do not speak. We seek somehow to match her calmness. We cannot. But a few seconds... We surrender to her serenity. We find ourselves tender. We find ourselves alone. And I'm going to read a poem that's dedicated to, uh, you know, him over there, uh, Peter. Uh, and it's actually, uh, it's interesting. This is a, it's a, it's a jack. There's a Jack Pearson is, is is this queer artist. I've been looking at his work for like a gazillion years, and he finds um, he goes around and he finds uh, leftover, you know, discarded uh, uh, alphabets, you know, from advertising things like big A's and big T's and you know things like that, and then puts them all together in these big pieces, or he makes little ones depending on what he finds. This one was based on a piece called The Right Way to Cry, C-R-Y, in caps. Moon River, Audrey Hepburn somewhere sings, the window open, the New York skyline hovers as George Prepard leads away from the goddess using her own voice. Amazed, amused, the cinematic magic whiffs, but aren't there tears? What to do with the placidity of moonlit drives, head full of notions of lust, love, that 
perfect chin, Hollywood handsome, Hollywood beautiful, not a wrinkle in sight, not real, not real, as the placards proclaim, good health, more wealth, the right way to cry. Tears are the hidden rivers. Face turns from the family argument. Heads point west or point east. Or desolation carries feet north. Hear this child beating a pillow, beating his bed frame, hitting his mother. Bearing his shame, stumbling in the school parking lot, waiting for a police cruiser to pick him up, then smash his chubby body against the wall. Here's the ordinary mythos, the boy, the mother, the argument, love, who can tender this grim American mythos, Hollywood? In the story, the gigolo owns up to his hard work a proper manifestation of work-life balance, while the party girl wears her pearls until her guy's lifts, revealing the steely spine of a true survivor. While the hidden river welcomes the moon's full face and cinematic goddesses choreographed that dance with the chance that something new could erupt, volcanic from soil search, how tantalizing to think of hope when Tears create oceans, as in dreams, that dare the dreamer to jump into the New York skyline, feet first. Skyline spiky, twinkling, isn't it the night here? But morning in the desert is when the children can play by the pool until the sun's winds amplifies the beige ground, the green shrub, a desolation row of suburban houses, tears smatter hypoallergic pillows, no germs allowed, no skylight, just lads naked around the pool, friendly to each other, but secretive. What tears them apart is a dream of perfect freedom. They've yet to find that work-life balance. They have no jobs. In the story, a man braces for a fall into the New York skyline, floating in dream space, hands open in the thick dream air. The wail from the street below poses another strategy of hearing how this might be the perfect way to jump. And I thank Peter for that phrase. And then two more. This is... Uh, as many of you know, I've been writing and also I just also kind of for a little bit for uh, BJ, although it's dedicated to Greg Tate. We're writing about the devil's wife. And she's not a happy girl. Uh, and I'm really, really not happy. Uh, and so this, I haven't, but she got me into the best American poetry uh, <laughs> volume and first time in 23 years. Okay. The Devil's Wife Explains Broken 45s. There was a time, James Brown sang, and I want to dance, but that causes the devil to prance upon me, then lash his, hire his leaves around my waist and squeeze me till my voice box almost shatters. You're a doll, he says, and he smashes our turntable, laughing at the clatter, ancient 45 RPMs make as they break treasures from a lost last century when sweet soul music elevated our sizzling feet. How he hated haloed afros radiant with pride and that slide away from suffering. The devil hates black genius. Made him work harder than hard to render it witless and dope stung. He hates having to move one iota out of his trifling comfort zone. Can I listen to one piece of my heart untarnished by his dial? Child's soul music is now in limbo, and me bruised again, cleaning up those broken 45s. But somewhere on the other side of this sad kingdom, another woman augurs the audio, and James Brown sings, There was a tag. All right, and I'm going to finish uh, this with two. 
apologies for two amazing women, and they both died in the same year. Uh, the first one will be for Aretha Franklin. And I was in France when this happened. So it's called Crying in Cassis for the Queen of Soul. The Queen of Soul, breath gone on an August night, or was it early morning, near dawn? The Queen of Soul, whose reign was challenged by baby divas with scurrying voices, rose up, but they never got near to her throne. She was born a citizen of a nation that called brown people queens and dukes and earls and counts, but rarely citizens. Born citizen of a nation that found tongues loosened in the framed temples of justice, love, and recognizable rage. God's people vilified, God's people saved in rhythm rhyme time, kept better with the beating back of those who could not name the God they worshiped, mammon, or offer succor to anyone not like themselves. Voice travels across hearts doors, which once open could not be closed. Voice travels deep in the temple compass, mocked and degraded, open up and hear these words. Think, respect, trouble, love, respect, love, think, 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 love. French voices shout in the bright late afternoon. The Mediterranean sparkles today. It will sparkle tomorrow. But the heavens, oh, they will sparkle like never before. The queen of soul, the voice that marked and framed a generation of citizens American, then global soul in Dakar, Accra, Tunis, Johannesburg, Seoul, and Marseille, Manchester, London, Paris, Berlin, on the radio, in Cologne, Santiago, Tokyo, and Chiang Mai. Her voice trails Memphis, St. Louis, Chicago, Detroit, great migration in chords and harmonies, melodies memorable, choruses repeated, trails of tenderness and terror, woman on the road, body loved, betrayed, slapped about, salved with new kisses, woman on the road, queen of the train tracks, bus routes, plane rides, car trips, the great migration, circles of motion, moving in her voice, a legacy, her star matters brightly as Mars, so keen to be seen, this anim, battle-weary, resting. And then finally, on the death of Clarabelle Alegria, and I wrote this when I was in uh, Florida at uh, the Rauschenberg Residency in Captiva, and uh, on the island, and you could see the star, you could see all of the star patterns. And finally, I could see Orion. So Orion shows up here. All right. On Earth, she marked her days with rage and love and fought the generals and their armies of thieves and murderers. Excuse me. Sorry about that. This is when the allergy medicine is not working. <laughs> All right. On the death of Clara Bell Alegria, 1924-2018, on earth she marked her days with rage and love and fought the generals and their army of thieves and sorcerers. Her pen was mighty, so also their own. Death is a shadow twin the one remaining in the foothills by the back door in a convent off a mountainside. And yet a mother's breast awaits her infant's mouth, a rooster crows and children gather for food there is, while bells ring across the foothills when the soldiers leave. A music of hope even as another child is buried and a landmine erupts a few kilometers from hospital. We live in a time of suffering in places of beauty, where the water and air meet in mountain dark soil. Food grows effortlessly, and so does greed. We live in a time of suffering in places of beauty, where yesterday's rebel is today's president, and greed cowers the hurt children who hunger not only for their mother's milk, 
but a safe place where peace storms the land with smiles and the tender removal of all aspects of war. A phantasm of peace, a peace unlike the other one, negotiated and then neglected thus military rifles, handguns, machetes, buoy knives, unexploded landmines, all made so that peace will end and terror return. What you hear is the sea. The heavy waves come in, go out. Stars pattern Orion's belt, or is that his heel? And then Another woman of letters departs. Will she step on Orion's heel? Would she say, excuse me, I, I did not see your heel. Would she try to hide her error as her celestial garments drag across the night sky? What if Orion could speak? And if he did, would he say, all the poets love my heel or my belt, you're not the first to think anchor here. Thank you. Thank you so much for that amazing reason, reading. Um, before I invite all three of our readers back up here for a brief conversation, I just want to remind everyone that we have books and CDs um, on sale. So please do get your copy um, of our artist's work today and get it signed while they're here. Um, also, uh, in honor of National Poetry Month, over there on that table next to the drinks and snacks um, are Slappering Hall Press chapbooks that we're giving away for free. Also in honor of National Poetry Month in collaboration with the Academy of American Poets Poet Laureate Fellowship Program, um, we are giving away handouts of generative poetry writing prompts. And today that is um, inspired by one of Patricia Spears Jones's poems from her latest book. It's inspired by the poem Morning Glory, and that's printed out over there as well. And obviously in her book, which I hope you're all buying a copy of. So check all of that out. And with that in mind, please, the our, our three readers, please join us. You can, um, I think that maybe if two of you want to sit and one of you stand, however you want to do it, and we'll pass the mic around. <laughs> Uh, well, I think I think we're most curious to see if there are questions and comments that you have for each other as the artists here. Um, and if not, I'm happy to get us started. Okay, uh, something. <laughs> okay, great. Um, Thanks for joining us. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Sure. It can be more. It can be more casual Q and A if that's preferred, and people come up with with their books. Let's do that. Who's first? 